Right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar in the Value of Water in Canada series. I think this is number six in the, in the row. My name is Roy Brouwe. I'm the professor in uh, the Department of Economics, and I'm also the executive director of the Water Institute here at the University of Waterloo. Before we start the webinar, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm participating today from traditional territories of the First People. I participate today from land that is part of the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people. Um, you see a map here of the land. We're located on land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River as part of the Haldeman Treaty. University of Waterloo and its centers and institutes like the Water Institute are committed to raise awareness and contribute to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for action. And I encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional land where you are. So before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping items. Um, please add your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, you can do that at any time throughout the talk. And I will help the speaker then to get to those questions either during or after her talk. Use the chat box just for general comments or technical issues. And this webinar will be recorded uh, like the previous ones and posted to the Water Institute's YouTube channel afterwards. So I'm very happy now to introduce the speaker for today, Professor Laurie Bradford. Dr. Bradford is an interdisciplinary social scientist who was recently named CERC Canada Research Chair in incorporating social and cultural values into engineering design. She's an assistant professor jointly appointed in the Ron and Jane Graham School of Professional Development, College of Engineering and the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan. Her background in biochemistry, environmental studies, and social psychology help her to bridge disciplines to explore community-driven research on issues of water security with partners from treaty areas two to 10. Dr. Bradford is chief editor as well of the Engaged Scholar Journal, which also explores theories and practices of engaged and community-based scholarship. And in her talk today, Laurie will share her insights into social and cultural values for water from community engaged research. Laurie, we're very happy to have you with us today. I'm happy to hand over the floor to you. Thank you so much, Roy, for the invitation. And hello to everybody who's joining us today. I'm just going to share, oops, share my presentation. Great, so thank you for the introduction, Roy. Uh, I am Laurie Bradford, I'm CRC in incorporating social and cultural sciences into engineering design. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I identify as autistic. So this presentation also purposefully uses the open dyslexia font. So this, this font that you see here is designed for people who have dyslexia. Um, and, you know, it's not part of my playful spirit, but it's also here to help as an EDI strategy. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at that font and use it in the future um, if you find purpose for doing so. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here from Treaty 6 territory today. I'm in Saskatoon, and it's also the homelands of the Métis. Um, my research takes place across the plains and into the, in the north of Canada. Um, so that involves people like the Siksika, Soto, Cree, Dene, Jibwe, Assiniboine or Nakoda, Dakota, and others. Um, in some of that work, I want to share with you a lesson that I, I was able to um, ha have with gratitude to Dene Chichim Uruk and Elder Janine Oromenko from Clearwater River Dene Nation. So as a biochemist, I'm also, you know, when I started, I was very interested in water sampling and doing biochemical analysis of water, but they taught me that in their culture, water is a sentient being. And just like a nurse would introduce themselves before they take a sample of your blood for analyses, we should greet the water, tell the water our intentions, introduce ourselves before we take a sample from them. So that's a lesson that you can take away. Um, you'll notice also that the images in my presentation have a description underneath. So here it says images of a settler hand dipping into a water body and the source of the image. This is so that anybody who is visually impaired and uses a screen reader can also be able to um, understand the images that are used in this presentation. And a final kind of uh, equity, diversity and inclusion point on my presentation is uh, I do use some citations during the presentation. 
This is the makeup of the authors that were involved in those citations. And if anybody watching this presentation has some um, uh, citations that they would like to send me that might write, round out uh, this authorship pool for me, that would be most welcome. Okay, so let's get into the presentation. Today, I wanna to share with you a collection of social and cultural values for water that we've learned from our experience in community engaged scholarship in the prairies. Over the last 10 years or so, we've been engaged with different communities in treaty areas two through 10 around issues of water security. And my terminal degree is in social psychologist. And, and as a social psychologist, I'm most interested in issues where individuals and groups interact or are in conflict or have to cooperate to solve problems and what those interactions might look like um, to produce better decisions over the long term. So in our work, one of the things that we've coined is the term called water empathy. And that's the ability to understand and be responsive to the water values or needs of another group or sector that are using a shared water resource. So acts of water empathy have been noted in the past. Things like sharing senior license owners in Alberta river systems, transferring allocations to help other sectors during times of drought. Um, another example might be uh, collaborative information sharing in Australia's lower Burdekin for better natural resource management and decreased impacts to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so this is just one example of the ways that we've been able to find some social and cultural values for water. Uh, over the last decade, we have found a whole bunch. I'm going to share a little snippet of them today and then go into a lot of detail on three. Um, so this is an inc incomplete list. I'm going to name them for you now and provide a quick example before I get into the detailed ones. So I've already said water empathy production. Another example um, uh, is Daly and Castleton's work on discussing a water sharing network through radio in Coral Harbor, Nunavut. So another is what social justice, water as a social justice lever. And so when we think of the work of Autumn Peltier or the grandmothers walking the Great Lakes or walking the St. Lawrence River, um, they're actually um, channeling the value of water to produce social justice. Landscape aesthetics, so that enhances our well-being. Water as a filter or for filtration, such as in natural or constructed wetlands. Water for waste reduction, as in dilution of natural or spilled chemicals. Water for soundscaping, providing increased quality to your soundscape and providing a rhythm to the seasons. For example, with spring and fall, break up and freeze up in the river systems. Water for preservation of local cultures. And this is through ceremonies and languages associated with water features. Water for thermal comfort, cooling in the summer, maintaining ice in the winter for hunting and for traveling. Water for daylight views and for neighborhood quality improvement. So we all can think about this in terms of real estate prices, but we also think about it of quality of local recreational activities and quality of, the, of um, sites for medicinal plant production. Water for fire safety has been mentioned by communities. Waterways uh, can block fires from, from traveling farther and water is there for water bombers. Water for anti-vandalism and by creating a barrier for settlers to get places, water is valued uh, by indigenous communities that I've worked with for this. Water for biodiversity enhancement and habitat production. Water as a genetic reservoir. So being able to do things like eDNA sampling or test RNA viral loads is recognized by communities. Water for healing, such as through hydration, through cleaning, through ceremonies. Water for place names and place attachment. And here I include the anglicized version of a Cree word, Kisikasiwina Wisipi, which means swiftly flowing river. So this is the Cree word for the site that we know as Saskatchewan. There are other um, terms as uh, values as well that have been mentioned. So this includes water for medicinal plant production, water for forgiveness, water for historic preservation. So I share those examples to give you a little taste of some of the values that have emerged from community engaged scholarship over the years. But now I wanna focus on three and we only have half an hour today to discuss them and I can't get into all of those. But so I chose three where we have a lot of data to share. So we'll explore deeper insights about water as a social justice lever, water for filtration, and water for landscape aesthetics and daylight views. And these are shared from perspectives by community members involved in engaged research across the prairies. Last uh, point before we get into the data, 
some definitions. So my uh, definition for CES, community engaged scholarship, involves the weaving of teaching discovery and service with community engagement. Um, so this definition was taken from the results of eight universities together in 2014 at the Community Engaged Scholarship Critical Junctures in Research Practice and Policy Conference. It also includes that there must be a balance of power, equitable, equitable distribution of financial and other resources, and shared models of practice between partners to co-design, co-implement, co-analyze, co-distribute, and be co-responsible for research programs. I needed to have a ditch definition here of water value. This, after all, this is what it's about. And here I share one from the special rapporteur on the right to water. So beyond the issues of pricing, water values include the environmental, social, and cultural value people place on water. For instance, in daily life, water can mean health, hygiene, dignity, and productivity. In culture, religious and spiritual places, water can mean a connection with creation or community or ceremony. And in natural spaces, water can mean peace and preservation. Water means different things to different people in different settings and at different times. So in my new role as a CRC, um, I'm really focused on helping to bring social and cultural values into engineering design. And this arose because of the 2019 changes to the Impact Assessment Act of Canada. So while before 2019, the impact assessments were mainly focused on environmental and, and economic impacts, Today's environmental impact assessments need to include impacts to health, social, or economic conditions. And there's a special role there for Indigenous communities to be involved. In this presentation, where possible, I've included a few complementary results that I've been able to find from uh, contingent valuation, choice modeling, replacement costs, pricing, stated preference, et cetera. But I am in no means an economist. So this work is just shared complementary. Okay, so now on to water as a lever for social justice. In her 2015 work on Canadian in the Canadian Women's Studies Journal, a uh, legal scholar and CRC in, in Indigenous Environmental Justice and an Anishinaabe woman from Whitefish River First Nation, Deborah McGregor, reminds us that the United Nations General Assembly in 2010 adopted Resolution 64292 for the right to water and sanitation, which is intended to guarantee water and sanitation are available, accessible, safe, and affordable for all people without discrimination. So we now have SDG 6 because of this, but our dominant discourse, she reminds us on water, still treats water as a resource with an economic value where competing interests and conflicts can resolve through which use produces more value in dollars. But she says that approaches like that deny social justice and equity when a dominant use supersedes one that promotes equity because of its ability to defend its use versus financial measures. An example is utility arguments for irrigation schemes, which have now been shown to be unsustainable over the long term by Mahoya and um, uh, Mabonagaba in 2018 and others. And unchecked irrigation and cropping has damaged groundwater resources for future populations. So if you look at work at, by Fam Familietti and Dalen and all, you'll see these conclusions. In McGregor's work, as well as others like Murdoch 2018, Wilson 2017, et cetera, and echoed in the UN human right to water and sanitation through UNDRIP, water and justice is achieved when we prioritize well-being and our relations with other beings but also considering not just the trauma experienced by people in other life, but the trauma the water themselves experience as a sentient being in need of, his, of healing. Only when the waters themselves are well and able to fulfill their duties to all creation is water just, justice achieved. So this is work by Deborah McGregor, who brings us to that conclusion. So in various partnerships for research on water um, that I've been involved with, this goal of scaffolding the justice of people users of water with the need for water itself to be able to fulfill its own purpose has become central. Across the world, we see uh, the pursuance of the rights of personhood in the Funganui, in the Magpie, in the Klamath rivers. So in some cosmologies, we're learning to understand that water itself um, has uh, it value as a sentient being. So I'm gonna share two examples now of that value for water playing out in our data. The first is about the inequities in the number of drinking water advisories on reserves. 
The second is about the placement of reserves in Saskatchewan with respect to their watersheds and the burden placed on reserve water bodies to then filter nutrients. Leading up to the watershed moment in the 2015 province to end long-term drinking water advisories on reserves by 2021 were decades of inequities in the provision of safe drinking water on reserves and several failed and ultimately ineffective policies and uh, action plans designed to do so. One benefit that the hard work towards that goal has achieved is that the research efforts such as our teams has revealed the complexities of the con context. So the inequity was not just a financial infrastructural one, nor one of poor training of operators or remoteness. After all, we've had clean water on the International Space Station for over 20 years. The inequity involved wider social and cultural values. So following on from the work of McLeod and, all, and others and Indigenous communities across Saskatchewan, we're gonna discuss what the drinking advisory inequities look like. And then we're gonna discuss how those inequities might be a result of the placement of reserves in Saskatchewan. Our first project uses data from the Water Security Agency in Saskatchewan and the classification of the Saskatchewan health plan covered populations across communities um, 145 towns and 306 villages, which had small drinking water systems. In addition, 70 Indigenous reserve communities that were included as part of the sample also shared data. There are 103 water systems in those 70 reserves that are federally funded and serve at least five households. Administrative data provided by the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations and the Water Security Agency consisted of all advisories issued for reserve and non-reserve water systems, with exception for the cities. Um, and this data was all merged together to look at general advisory characteristics, advisory type, community name, reasons for issuance, and the start and end dates of the advisory. So what we found is that over the four year study period, drinking water advisories, which were expected to be temporary, were not in certain um, communities. So we wanted to see how big that disparity was. Generalized estimating equations were used to determine significant factors contributing to the likelihood of drinking water advisories, comparing indigenous and non-indigenous communities of similar sizes in the North and in the South. So results indicated that the season and the interaction between community type and region, North versus South, were significant. Reserve communities in the North had a drinking water advisory count that was 5.19 times greater than those of reserves in the South. 6.2, 6, sorry, 2.63 times greater than the counts for towns in the South and 4.94 times greater than those of villages in the South. Additional comparisons indicated that reserves in the North had 2.43 times as many advisories as villages in the North. And the duration of these advisories also showed discrepancies. Indigenous communities spent as a median value one year plus a day on a drinking water advisory for the four year period of the research. So all of the Indigenous communities that were located in the North experienced drinking water advisories during this four year period. And those drinking water advisories lasted a year and a day on average or, or as a median value across the four year period. Can you imagine that for a year and it plus a day out of every four years, you cannot use your drinking water? So the magnitude of the problem here was calculated, but the social and cultural values associated with that inequity were made even more clear with interviews with nine communities as a part of the CIHR grant we did over the, over the same period. So when we talked with these communities, nine communities, seven to 22 interviews in each community, they told us that advisories were likely to start in the summer and the early fall, because on reserve, there's often only one operator who may take a vacation in the summer or the fall, leaving it difficult to access a truck for truck to cistern deliveries or qualified operator in these uh, remote and rural locations. This meant that any old available truck or operator that could be found was employed or used to transport or treat water, if any could be found. And contamination events could happen at any stage from the truck filling at the treatment plant to the cistern itself and through household taps. Things like truck driver training, frequency of delivery, temperature, dust and windblown contaminants, animals getting into cisterns and pipes, 
as well as wider factors such as the model of the treatment plants built, which are often out of date and have great difficulty securing parts, difficulty finding repair experts to support those operators, or even poor quality source water coming in. Other members of the communities identified aging, degrading and inappropriate infrastructure, high levels of disinfectant byproduct usage, use of untreated water sources, no cleaning of cisterns and no funding to do so, and minimal source water protection planning impeding the provision of safe drinking water on reserves. All of these examples serve to illuminate the complexity of the problems, and they also built empathy and understanding among non-Indigenous researchers. So the shame and blame of dysfunctional water treatment plants was being reduced because now we know more about the complexity. We built water empathy through understanding what it means to create safe drinking water on reserves, or so we thought, because one of the most commonly reported issues in the interviews was a failure to appreciate how the treatment plant would fit into the culture of the community. Interviewers told us that some in the community would see a new plant as something imposed from outside instead of being able to bring people together and produce healing and their own solution. Thus, a working water treatment plant, something of value to the federal government as an actionable commitment being met, might have actually had a negative value in a community who wanted sovereignty. I'll come back to this when I share a photo voice and poster voice example later on. McFarland and Harris's 2018 review of 117 articles about the challenges facing small systems highlighted that geography, remoteness, under-regulated development, decentralized ownership, market forces, and jurisdictional fragmentation are repeatedly identified factors. But in our sample, we found that it, the uh, factors associated with poor water treatment uh, performance and, and um, higher rates of advisories we're more socially and culturally fixed. Communities tell us there's a feeling that water is not treated with the dignity it deserves as a sentient being, and thus it doesn't serve its purpose or produce its value by providing for the well being of others. We're told that we need to prioritize the well being and our relationships with water by considering not only the trauma experienced by people and other life due to water contamination, but the treatment of water itself. Social justice for water cannot just be measured by the number of advisories. It needs to be measured by the alignment of social and cultural values with the provision of water. But how does that value compare to other social and cultural values associated with water? Quantitatively, we know indigenous communities at, in Saskatchewan are now at a 5.19 times greater risk of being on advisory than non-reserve communities. Reducing that might seem to increase the value of water of these communities, but that doesn't tell the whole story. So the second example I want to share here is one where we did some work led by James Smith Cree Nation, Cumberland House and Yellow Quill First Nations who were interested in knowing why they continued to experience algae blooms, poor water quality in their surface waters, infrastructure damage and evacuations due to flooding and fish kills. So we co-wrote a grant application to the Global Water Futures Program, the Lake Winnipeg Basin Program, Environment Climate Change Canada, and Indigenous Services Canada to get funding to look at flooding, um, effects on well-being and community dynamics, and nutrient levels in their waterways. We also examined treaty rights around nutrients in water and watershed management activities in their treaty areas. We created a nutrient weighted accumulation flow index. So this is what you're seeing on the map on the, the right side of the screen. So this combines elevation, watershed hydrology, land use, runoff modeling, and past data on nutrient flows to calculate an index for the partnered reserves. Once we completed the three reserves, they asked us to do all the reserves in Saskatchewan, comparing the local towns and villages of similar size and composition. So a repeat of the water advisory kind of work, but based on uh, community elevation and where the nutrients flow. This was also to ascertain whether water was um, providing social justice for them or whether they were experiencing social inequity. What we found in this work was that most Indigenous reserves are located in the lower half of watersheds. They're located lower than nearby towns and villages of similar size. In the case of the top 10 highlighted here, they were at significantly lower locations and existed within watersheds with high rates of agricultural land use and terminal or collecting basins on the reserves. 
one partner, a co-author in a lot of our work, told us that when he was younger, he was proud of being from the Ishkonaganing. It was only as he became an adult and he learned that Ishkonaganing actually meant the wastelands, the land that was left over, that his pride was removed. So within our Lake Winnipeg Basin program and Global Water Futures program, we came to understand that reserve water bodies accumulated nutrients that did not originate there. And they stored, processed, or filtered them for the benefit of those up and downstream. Over the course of these projects, we did LIDAR, we produced a digital elevation maps. We trained local people to use photometers, nutrient apps, and we did laboratory water sampling to measure the accuracy of the community science tools. So we could put the tools of water quality measurement and monitoring into the hands of community members. We found an increase of nutrients in the on-reserve areas that we were measuring. In some cases, such as Yellow Quill First Nation highlighted here, magnitude five increase in phosphate in the terminal water bodies that were located on reserve. The water outside of the outlet, which is controlled by floodgates managed by the Nut Lake Watershed Authority, who have no members from Yellow Quill First Nation, despite the dam being only meters north of the reserve, did not have as great a magnitude ride in rise in nutrients. We found that the water control measures were a source of social injustice on the reserve. The water was being held hostage and could not do its job of moving nutrients and filtering them along a watershed but instead it was being forced to do that work. This was seen as an attack on water as a sentient being, personified by this piece of artwork produced by Trinity Sanderson, a youth from James Smith Cree Nation who attended a symposium on the research results. She called this piece Water Woman and her artist statement discusses the water the, that the woman who also represents water had to embrace her more than human powers to rid her body and the waterways that supported her from the excess nutrients through community prayer with other women and through forces from beyond. So this lack of ability to have a voice in managing water also came out in the Global Water Futures work where we made an agent-based model to look at the impacts of flooding on reserve. So here you see a screen capture at the bottom of one of the scenarios running in AnyLogic 12.0. This particular scenario looked at 10, 20, 50, and 100 year floods on the reserve and how roads would be impacted. We found that the main roads would be washed out and most buildings basements flooded in 50 and 100 year floods, meaning there would be no way to evacuate vulnerable community members and there would be long-term damage to the infrastructure and health of the community. Remember, the outlet is a few meters off reserve and they have no say in when it gets opened. Thus, their community floods repeatedly and has to repair and replace key infrastructure. And second, their lake, a once sacred water source for the community is no longer of sufficient quality to serve their water treatment plant and provide for the community due to nutrient accumulation. Complicating the efforts for justice here is that the provincial policy for water control structures is to be controlled by watershed authorities who often don't have an indigenous voting member. Secondly, for illegal drainage to be investigated, both the complainant and the accused are investigated. But the Water Security Agency, a provincial agency, cannot investigate on reserves since reserves are federal lands. So a jurisdictional here means that the reserve um, injustices cannot be investigated. And there's no compensation for the damage and impacts on the reserve society and culture. Having these phenomena studied and now having these water data in their hands provides an opportunity for social justice to be sought. It also contributes to our understanding of why water values may be different and aggressively sought by Indigenous water leaders such as Autumn Peltier and the grandmothers. One further point on this work, we actually did take a look at who may have some responsibilities in nutrient management in treaties four, five, and six. We completed an environmental scan and phoned each organization um, or rural municipality to find out what they were doing for nutrient and watershed management. Here's what we found. In treaty four area, 35 organizations had a role to play in nutrient management. Only one reported having a strategy in place or in the works. In Treaty 5 and 6, 51 organizations were tracked. Three organizations had nutrient management plans, five had agricultural management plans, and only one, James Smith First Nation, who had a Lake Winnipeg Basin program grant with our team, had Indigenous engagement as part of their work. So next, Along with legal scholars, we looked at whether any treaty rights might be at risk. 
And what we found was that there may be. None of these uh, rights as, as listed in the treaties and in other documents have been contested within the systems they could. But it's worth noting that water can be interpreted and has been interpreted as having a treaty right within these documents that we've reviewed. So there was the value of sui, of sui generis of its own kind. There's no legal precedence. It's an opportunity that communities can take. Waters were never specifically discussed in treaties except to delineate treaty boundaries. Sacred lands, which were promised protection, included hunting territories and fishing territories. So fishing territories is the key point here. If the water is not healthy, then fishing territories are not being protected. An elder said um, in his relaying of what happened at the commission is that all the creatures under the water, that too, I didn't come to ask you for them. That water will continue to be yours, implying that the fish and the water will be maintained in safety in perpetuity. The principle of Conotisawin is written into the treaties as well, but that principle of cleanliness of the environment is not being met. So I wanna move on, I'm just noting the time here, to summarize this idea of a value for water towards social justice. The Lake Winnipeg Basin, here mapped out by the Lake Winnipeg Indigenous Collective and overlaid with the treaty areas, has seven treaty areas and more than 200 First Nations. Within our discussions with communities across a broad collection of projects in these treaty areas, uncovering values for water, one strategy was more concerning than others. As with many resources in the prairies, there was the fear that a water quality trading scheme may emerge in the basin alongside a water quantity trading scheme. Marked globally as an innovative strategy, um, alongside, or sorry, communities felt that meaningful conversations needed to occur with them about water quality trading and water quality credit or offset plans. And for some whose belief centered on water as a sentient being, a water quality trading scheme amounted to payment for abuse. Communities did not want a water quality trading scheme implemented. So to sum up, and recalling from McGregor, the goal of scaffolding social justice for the people users of water and the need for water to be able to fulfill its own purpose as a sentient being is a key value for Indigenous communities in this region. There is the understanding that in other ways of knowing and being, water in being denied its purpose as a sentient being to filter toxins and replenish the land and provide for the well-being others is not being treated in a just way. Communities can and are using this data to support further funding applications for more operations and maintenance funds, for contaminant measurement and treatment, and for other reasons. We might be able to find some willingness to pay or say to preference research to help illuminate the idea of water as a social justice value. We found some work by, by Roy and partners in 2005 that looked at water um, willingness to pay for flood protection as one. We found stated preference work on the 1997 agreement with New York City to protect the Catskills as an ecosystem filtration system for the city itself. And that work indicated, or indicated that the total cost of building and operating a filtration system was in the range of US $8 billion. In comparison, the total cost for protecting the water provision service of the Catskills watershed through land purchases was estimated to be one to one and a half billion dollars. So here in the Lake Winnipeg Basin, we're approaching a similar decision point. What do we protect to ensure water for drinking downstream? Okay, so now I wanna move on to the second set of um, values for water um, from our work. And this is water for landscape aesthetics and daylight views. In our engaged work, we've had many, heard many times about being able to live near or view water and how important that is for healing or for well-being. Water provided um, indigenous communities with reminders of their ancestors, of ceremonies, of roles and challenges they face sometimes daily. Some valuation studies for viewscapes exist, a lot based on real estate. And here's a couple. So Sailor's work in 2001 to 2005 valued um, Great Lake views. Um, so half of the sample of homes in their study had a clear view of Lake Erie, while the other half didn't. Um, it, Lake Erie provides many different viewscapes, including fresh water, freezes over in the winter. It has an ocean-like view because of its size. 
it generates waves large enough to surf. It also struggles with algae blooms. That said, they did find that having a lake view from your home around Lake Erie increased your home's value by at least $115,000, or by approximately 56%. Hamann and Isfan in 2017 found that 30 minutes viewing nature or being in nature had significant effects on your well being. Follow up studies show that the same amount of viewing nature or waterscapes on online cameras had similar effects too. So, nature heals. For this social value, I wanted to discuss two community engaged projects we did in Saskatchewan. First, a modified photo voice study, and second, an ongoing Q study. And that one's very new, so I'll just share a quick example. So with Yellow Quill First Nation in 2015 to 2017, we did a uh, photo voice project with youth as well as interviews with elders. We engaged youth in describing the values they held for water um, in a modified photo voice project. So we, we gave them cameras, we asked them to take pictures and instructed each other on what to take pictures on. And then as a part of an, an, an analysis of those, um, they sorted their pictures into groups they wanted to have together and put them on posters, then decided where they were gonna share those posters and discuss them. So this modified photo voice, which we called post, poster voice happened with 19 junior rangers in the community. They coded their pictures into group and they discussed connections between their knowledge of water and perceptions about how water is valued and pertains to overall health. Here we see three posters that were shared. While their instructions to each other were to take pictures of anything that reminded them of water health, the vast majority of pictures were of landscape views and aesthetically pleasing sites, in their words. This does not belay a um, in more in-depth understanding of the water cycle. In fact, the students in their sharing circles noted water as being on the surface, underground, and in the atmosphere. They said clouds were water. Clouds also represented their ancestors and brought teachings with them. They also told us that today's clouds could bring toxins like acid rain. They told us which dugouts were swimmable and which ones weren't. They told us which lakes and wetlands were brackish, salty, which ones healed sores and which ones didn't. They told us which water bodies provided the best reflections and which didn't. They also included humor, taking pictures of toilets, culverts, and ice cube trays, human ideas on how to, re re on how to reproduce what nature does for us already. Important to landscape aesthetics, youth showed us the differences between taking a picture of a sunset with and without water and how water augmented their views and the colors. In taking these pictures, sorting them and sharing them, youth perspectives were added into the discussion of the community values for water. So here's another set of the posters. Overall, three things emerged in this project. Youth valued the aesthetics of on-reserve water assets. They were abuse averse to polluted waters with pollution brought on by outsiders, which led to the risk of losing opportunities to undertake traditional and contemporary activities like ceremonies and fishing. In the middle poster, in the middle picture, you can see a picture of an illegal trench. This is considered ugly and unnatural and an imposition by settlers to um, destroy the health of the water on a reserve. Youth also exhibited pride for their water treatment plant. This last value around, around water as a technology was in conflict with community elders. We interviewed 22 of them and they saw the treatment plant as a colonial imposition and a reminder of dependence on the government. So you remember that figure I shared earlier on with the, the circle in the triangle, which showed the imposition symbolically. The elders felt what they call, what is called a sense of survivance around the treatment plant, which is surviving in a hostile environment, but also within that space, resisting a settler colonial logic of erasure. And that's according to Weisner in 2008. The elders discussed how due to the popularity and celebrity of the treatment plant among the youth, the elders now had to educate their youth about why they needed a water treatment plant in the first place and why they could no longer drink from the lake as they once did, as they told in their traditional story. So an opportunity cost lost. As a social and cultural impact during sharing circles where youth shared their posters, there was much conversation between elders and youth about the treatment plant such that in future iterations, we as researchers recognize that this discussion could faction communities, despite sharing circles being facilitated by a community coordinator. 
The conversations were sometimes adversarial with the elder generation and the youth at odds about the treatment plant, but in agreement about the beauty of the water bodies on reserve. The impact is that the treatment plant displaced a culture of not just enjoying the beauty of water as an aesthetically pleasing thing, but respecting and appreciating the natural water bodies as sentient beings and providers to the community. The displacement of this part of the culture was felt by the elders as being brought on by the treatment plant, a negative value for water that goes unnoticed in settler perceptions of what is valued in Indigenous communities. Thus, while one generation's social values for technology and the availability of high quality water is of positive value and is shared as a success by federal government, another generation in the same location has an understanding of the same phenomenon of negative cultural value. So the final example I will share emerges around the value of water for daylight use. A recent project that we did is looking at community co-design of new subdivisions on reserves. So with two partner communities and funded by Indigenous Service Canada, um, the communities are looking at how they would like to co-design the subdivision to reflect their members' interest. Um, here is a picture of 24 different layouts of Indigenous communities that currently exist. Uh, because of the pandemic, we were unable to be in communities in, per in person, so we did an online queue methodology or queue sort, asking community members to sort these into least preferred and most preferred design. We then factor analyzed sorts in the communities um, and presented the most preferred and least preferred um, uh, combinations as factors to decision makers. So here I'm just sharing one factor from one community of which there were several communities and several factors for each community. The most preferred layout in one particular factor um, had a grid following the path of the water with an open water view. You see the high Z score here. When we asked people to explain why they preferred that view, these are the answers we got. As long as there's water close by, I was good. I liked the water is there, et cetera, et cetera. Things look bleak with no trees or water. So in the community co-design work for these subdivisions, the highest ed scores were for a water view. Water as a landscape aesthetic and daylight views were valued by these particular communities. So, so to sum up, as in other work, we've been learning about the landscape aesthetic and daylight views that water hold values were of water values held by indigenous communities here in the prairies. I wanna come back now to that long list I did at the beginning. So we did have water, water as an empathy producer, water for waste reduction, soundscaping, preservation of lo local cultures, thermal comfort, neighborhood quality improvement, fire safety, anti-vandalism, biodiversity enhancement, genetic uh, reservoir healing, place names, et cetera, et cetera. Although I only discussed three example to note today, it's important to note that for each of the values symbolized are around this circle, there are nuances that continue to be revealed through community engaged scholarship and ongoing collaborations. Reflecting back and looking forward, so my CRC is on incorporating social and cultural sciences into engineering design. Some of the objectives I have are to take stock of our successes and our research needs in building understanding between values in different societies and cultures. And this is to inform engineering practices into the future. I hope that today I've contributed to some of that work by sharing values around water um, as shared to me by indigenous communities. I reflect back on this work on water values as a step toward my objectives, but I also, uh, invite others to work with me to help ensure that I am valuing water in appropriate ways so that decision makers can take this information and bring it into the decision making cycle. I want to take some effort toward reducing community and generational factioning as well as building water empathy across our nation. I'm neither an engineer nor an economist, but as a social scientist, the work of my team is not exclusive from these areas, but complementary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you very, very much. So everyone who's attending, thank you very much for being with us here today. Uh, please enter your question in the Q&A box. I just wanted to um, 
um, read out loud, uh, Laurie, that Ariel, um, I hope I pronounce his last name correctly, Lisa Gorski, um, is, um, is, is highly appreciative of the uh, commitment um, and direct acknowledgement of improved accessibility. So he's very um, grateful for um, the way you started your, your talk and how you uh, tried so, uh, uh, so much to make this uh, accessible to, um, to, to everyone. So um, a word of thanks from, from Ariel. So those of you who have other questions from uh, for, for Lori, please enter them in the Q&A box. I will start the discussion, Lori, by asking you a couple of questions my, myself, perhaps first. Um, so you really gave us a lot of things to, to think about. Um, and some of these um, um, uh, cases that you, that you are going through just um, raised a number of questions with me. So I, I was intrigued by by what you were talking about when it came to these boiling advisories and and the um, uh, resistance um, to to adopt um, technologies that that, that seemingly uh, were imposed on these communities uh, top down. Um, um, do you do you have any ideas of of how how you know how how would you go about this? differently um, in, in your view? Sure. Thanks, Roy. I do get this question from engineers a lot. I am in the College of Engineering and, and many will say to me, why don't we just put in a water treatment plant? You know, why doesn't that solve the problem? Um, but the, the lack of knowledge there is, is with the engineer on what the community values and what their culture values are toward water. In some communities, water is pure if it has nothing added to it. So if you put a chemical treatment plant into an indigenous community, that will be against their cultural value and that chemical treatment plant will be rejected. In some cases, it's been um, also you know, subject to arson or vandalism uh, because it's, a, it's an act of survivance. It's rejecting a colonial imposition um, while also surviving in a state of, of not having your needs met. Um, so there are a lot of researchers here and in other places that are looking at coming up with culturally aligned water treatment systems. The IBROM plants, the green sand filtration plants are more culturally aligned with the beliefs about what pure water is in some communities. The thing is the decision strategies used by the federal government to fund different water treatment systems don't always allow communities to choose the kind of treatment plant they want. They're based on the number of uh, members in the community and census numbers are, are uh, really inaccurate for Indigenous communities because people don't answer the door when a white settler comes knocking um, because of historical trauma. So um, communities might not have the choice in what kind of treatment plant they make, but if engineers take the time to find out what the cultural values are for water, then they can better align the recommended treatment plant for that community and they can be allies in applying to the federal government for an appropriate treatment plant for that community. Yeah. So, so do I hear you uh, make references to more of these nature-based solutions? Is, is that what you're saying? That, that those are that the is. kind of solutions that would be much more socially acceptable? That is, yes. Another project that I'm working on um, uh, with, some, with some researchers is on genomics and constructed treatment wetlands for oil sands processed water. And we're seeking the views of Indigenous communities on what they would consider to be appropriate plants, microbes, uh, appropriate genomic strategies to make constructed treatment wetlands. There's buy-in to constructed treatment wetlands, but only in, when done in a culturally aligned way. Okay, thank you. Um, so please add your questions in the Q&A box. I, uh, in the meantime, I'm just continuing with my list, if you don't mind, uh, Laurie. <laughs> sure. I, I, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit more on, uh, on the water quality trading initiative in Lake Winnipeg. I, I, I'm not sure if I completely got, uh, got what you were saying about why this uh, idea of water quality trading is, is, uh, is, is rejected. Would you be able to uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, so the idea is, is rejected by communities that we've talked to because uh, for the most part, these communities are located in the lower parts of watersheds. Their water bodies might be located in closed basins or basins where they don't have a say in how the water flows or the water no longer flows in natural ways. 
which means that water bodies in their communities are being unfairly used by upstream and downstream communities to filter nutrients. Um, and they bear the brunt of poor water quality. In some communities, surface water bodies can no longer be used because the source water is not good enough for, for their drinking water treatment plants. Um, so what they, they believe is that it would be unfair to them um, to even just receive financial compensation for that because financial compensation um, doesn't restore uh, cultural impacts and social impacts. If they can no longer do water ceremonies because their surface water or the water sources are contaminated to work for settler economies, then they don't want uh, water quality trading schemes to, to emerge. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and have you so 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 a major challenge um, for for the more traditional um, and you were making some reference to economic values right? the, the the traditional economic thinking about values um, is 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 to basically express it in into monetary terms for an economist the, the the strongest indicator of value is 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 your behavior actually paying for a good or a service. Um, have you have you given it any thought of how we how we could how we could reconcile or how we could integrate these social and cultural values in um, in, in in a broader uh, framework value framework for example to inform decision making? So I'm not sure. Um, I think we would need a broader conversation with ethicists and philosophers, as well as justice experts, to ensure that that discussion is fulsome, as well as Indigenous scholars. Um, I personally would reject putting a price on a social or cultural value that these communities have brought forward to me. Um, but I'm not sure if if that's something that we could transfer. I did look for some literature on, you know, pricing of social justice. And while there is stuff, some for things like buying fair trade, um, or, um, you know, restoring um, uh, lands for for cultural practices, um, there isn't enough out there to really show whether it would be accepted or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's basically the limitation of uh, financial compensation, right? It, yes. You cannot yeah. financially compensate everything, as you mentioned before. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, we have a question from one of the previous uh, uh, presenters, Jean-Michel Larivier from uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, is asking, in locations where upstream aquatic ecosystem restoration is unfeasible or would not provide much ecological improvements, were there proposed alternatives to water treatment plant facilities that could obtain better acceptance by indigenous communities. Do you have any examples of successful projects? Hmm. That's a difficult one. Um, hmm. I can't think of an example off hand. Uh, I'm gonna have to give it some time. If you wouldn't mind emailing me that question, I'll spend some time mm -hmm. um, thinking it through to, to respond. Thank you so much, that's a difficult question. Yeah. So the proposed alternatives are maybe related to the nature-based uh, solutions that you were referring yeah. to before. Yeah, I know there's movement across the states for um, removal of, of uh, water structures, dams, canals, et cetera, to restore uh, natural flows. I know Cumberland House, Cree Nation, Métis, Local 42, and the Northern Village are also looking at um, the restoration of natural flows there through changing um, the patterns of dam release and getting more seasonally rhythmic dam releases. Um, we'll see if that goes into any new agreements. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So coming from Europe, um, where we have uh, some major pieces of legislation related to water quality, for example, um, and e-flows, um, do you see a role for um, more or additional regulation to, to, to factor in some of these aspects, these social cultural values that you're talking about? I would, and I do. Um, and this is where the impact assessment agency can jump in for new projects anyway, uh, to ensure that indigenous voice is included meaningfully um, throughout that whole conversation. Yeah, we did um, a SHRC funded partnership development grant led by Toddy Steelman on uh, the three inland freshwater deltas in Canada. And the main message coming out of that work is that we needed to restore natural flows. Um, so hopefully that message gets uh, carried through to the federal government and yeah that regulation ensues mm -hmm. okay 
Thank you. Right. I, I don't see any further questions. We're four minutes to the hour. So I propose I wrap up. I wanna thank you, Laurie, once again for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. You really gave us um, a, a lot to think about. It was a very um, a wonderful, broad, um, informative overview. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I wanna thank the audience uh, today as well for um, joining us in this, um, in this webinar series. I look forward to see you again, um, uh, half of September, the 14th of September, we have the next um, uh, webinar with Robert Smith. He's a principal uh, at Midsummer Analytics um, and he will talk about his work uh, related to the value of, um, of, of water. So I look forward to see you again in um, more than a month time. Enjoy your summer, um, your summer break, hopefully, and, um, and hopefully we can reconvene fresh in uh, September. Thank you all for participating. Thank you once again very much, Laurie, for uh, sharing um, your knowledge and your uh, research with us. Thank you all. Stay well. <laughs>